It's December 17th, 2020. This is Rook. It is a big December edition of Rook with lots to get to. This week, medical practitioner Hossein Mansouri became one of the first people in the world to administer that new Pfizer vaccine at his geriatric center in Montreal. He's on the line to share his experience. Then Iranian-Canadian Erfan Nasajpour. He was a rising basketball star in Canada when he decided to play professionally in Iran for almost a decade. He joins us in the Rook studio. And fitness guru and artist Mah Sorah Bari in London on how she fuses art and sport. Plus another edition of It's All Persian to Us. These are stories from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode number 71 of Rok Durud Chekhabar. We're at rookmedia.com and we are on our ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're coming to you on SoundCloud, Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, Telegram. Hello, Groovy Shaya. Hello, Zam. Do you know the answer of Chekhabar? Uh, Chekhabar. Salamati. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Shai. <laughs> Interrupted the flow there, but I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> hello, the fabulous Kion. Hi, Jean. With your Kola cap. Uh, hello. <laughs> Salamati. Oh. Uh, hello, Captain Reza. Hello, sir. What a show today, Captain Reza. I know. This is quite a show. We have Maso Rahbadi, uh, an Iranian British fitness guru, an artist who uh, has been gaining a devoted uh, fan base around the world. She's joining us from London, England in an hour or so. So she's got this compelling story of finding her freedom in leaving Iran and pursuing her dual passions of art and sport. She had to choose, she put them together. Uh, so she's an interesting character. We'll get to her in a little over an hour. We have Erfan Nasajpour, Captain Reza, a young star Iranian-Canadian basketball player in Canada. He decides to go and play professional basketball in Iran All for right. a few years. Um, he'll bring his story. It's also a story of how sport uh, changed his life and saved his life, right? Yeah. Uh, and in just a few minutes, Hossein Mansouri, this is an Iranian-Canadian medical practitioner who was the first person to administer the new COVID-19 vaccine in Canada on Monday in Montreal. He'll join me. Plus, Keon is here with another installment of It's All Persian to Us. What a show. What a show. Right? Full house. Uh, happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Uh, to those celebrating Hanukkah. Um, next week, speaking of holidays, on Monday, Yalda night and Christmas week. We are dropping on Monday night our four-part original series, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession. Four parts, 15 guests from around the world in English and Farsi. That's on Monday on all the regular platforms. We're going to drop them all at once. Our four-part series, Why Pink Floyd. We've been working on this for a while. But, you know, by the way, my mother... Uh-huh. was very ups- upset after the last show. This is a, a tip to all uh, young Iranians or non-Iranians out there. Uh, do not upset your Persian mom. Well, who was yeah. she upset at? She was upset well, Who uh, always me. Oh, okay. She wouldn't be upset at you guys. <laughs> you. She is the sweetest, the most wonderful person in the world. But she's also upset at me. So And, and she's like perfected this way of asking a question when there's clearly like an opinion behind it <laughs> so um so she i guess she heard the last show i mean to, to recap shia and i were here till uh you know the wee hours and we talked on the on the last show about how we ordered some fast food shia's recommendation you know <laughs> and so yes yeah, so my mother i get this test text message from her um oh hello dear um I, I see you ordered KFC, <laughs> right? Like just a statement, but clearly there's an agenda behind the statement, right? And I'm like, um, 
uh, hi mom yes yes we did it was uh and then i'm also always the cause of whatever transgression is involved <laughs> like it was even this was like shia's recommendation right but she's like um so then i call her and i'm telling her and she's like mm, so you you got to the kfc for you and shia and i'm like no shia <laughs> bought it and she's like uh-huh but you like kfc so that you know so uh, and then it's like uh, you could have come and had some of your mother's food, but I, I suppose you were too busy, you know. Aww. So then it's about uh, why did, now I don't visit enough, right? Yep. Now the now the conversation has gone from the Pink Floyd special and KFC to I'm not visiting my mother enough. I'm a bad person, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, and I said to her, "Mom, it was like three in the morning. What am I supposed to? I mean, uh, your mother's kitchen is Aww. always open. You could have come, and we could have made. You know, okay. I, my impression of my mother sounds like Shia. Yeah. I was just <laughs> thinking Actually, that. Oh. When, Shia, <laughs> when Shia meets my mother, it's gonna blow. Um, <laughs> salon. Oh, hi, Shia. Um, um, if the car me queen man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the same, same person. person. <laughs> Maybe this is why I love Shia so much. She reminds me of my mother. Anyway, listen. Uh, my mother is, first of all, she's the greatest cook in the world. Of course, uh, I mean, as well as Chef Haas. Yeah. <laughs> to think about all the people on the Don't Rook team. Anybody. We're insulting, yeah. No, she is, the, and uh, Reza's girlfriend. Everybody's a good cook. Yeah. But uh, my mother is amazing. Tabrizi de you yes. know, and... Uh, but uh, you know, and I, I promised her we'll I'll come and pick up Persian food for us. Yes. Uh, and I knew her first engine is number one in the world. Your, your well, mom. it's hard to. I mean, a lot of what my mom makes yeah. is the best in the world. Yeah. She's really. Are uh, you trying to win her love back? Right no, now? I. That's that's a fact. There's no chance that I can win. I mean, she yeah. is. There's always going to be an issue like this. This it took me back to. I mean, when I was a kid, it would be like, oh. I see you've dyed your hair. You know, it was never, I don't like your dyed hair. Mm. Why did you put orange streaks in your hair, you little punk? It was, oh, I see you've dyed your hair. And then I knew what that meant, right? Oh, oh yes. I see you I see you have pointy boots, you know? <laughs> so this now, it's like, I see you ordered KFC. <laughs> it never ends. But you know, this is a consistent theme with Persian parents. They love to guilt trip their kids, I know. always. I know. No matter what. And she's, you know, she's concerned about uh, her health. I mean, wow. uh, you know, the way it's shy told the story I was passed out <laughs> wasted on the ground with KFC and whatever you know uh, illegal substances I mean it was like we had a beer and had some chicken you know but uh, anyway uh, my mother's the best oh. uh, I love you mom and uh, we'll you know uh, be expecting some hush to cadu <laughs> or something this weekend. Uh, the fabulous Keon. Any hints as to what we will learn on the uh, today's edition of It's All Persian to Us? Only that it ties in with the holidays. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, yeah. that is coming up. Masar Ahbadi coming up. Erfan Nasajpour coming up. But first, let's get to our first guest. This week, an Iranian-Canadian medical practitioner became one of the first people in the world to administer the new Pfizer vaccine for COVID-19 when he injected a patient with the vaccine at his facility in Montreal. Hossein Mansouri is a registered nurse who has been working in the medical field for years, first with the United Nations in Iran, specifically with uh, refugees on the Iran-Afghanistan border, before immigrating to Canada in 2009. Since 2012, he has been working as a nurse team leader at the Donald Berman Maimonides Geriatric Center in Montreal. And it was this facility that was chosen as one of the first places to receive and administer this new vaccine. Of course, the vaccine has made headlines around the world. And Hossein was part of those headlines a couple of days ago as cameras caught him doing his job. This was a particularly personal moment for Hossein, not only because he has been a nurse on the front line, Lines of fighting this disease over the last year, but because just one month ago, his older brother died of COVID in Iran. Right now, Hossein Mansouri joins me from Montreal. Hello, sir. Hello, Mr. Jian. You know, it's an honor to have you on the show, especially given that uh, the work you do and you are doing uh, has been so important. Let me say thank you for the service you do on the front lines from all of us uh, dealing with this devastating pandemic. We would be nowhere without brave people like you. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Jian, I should thank you because you're giving me this opportunity to talk to 
uh, my people to friends and uh, so a lot of people will hear us and I appreciate uh, your support and your invitation for this uh, conversation. Uh, Hussein, this has obviously been quite a week for you. First of all, our deepest condolences with the loss of your dear brother to COVID in Iran. I, I'm sure that has been so difficult for you and your family. And now here you are as one of the first people in the world to administer the vaccine to a patient. Uh, how are you processing this week? How does it feel for you? So, you know, um, I lost my elder brother because of COVID. And it was very sad for me when I heard. I couldn't believe it. I know that this virus is very serious and because it's almost nine or ten months that we are working in a, a risky situation and every day we have to wash a lot of time the hands and wear masks, put the face shield all the time, be careful and even our uh, contact with our family members, it was very limited and with the hard situation that we had and hearing that I'm losing my brother that I know, he was very generous and he was very kind to all people around him, especially for me, that I have a lot of uh, memories, souvenirs from him. Mm -hmm. And he was very uh, lovely person, not just to me, for a lot of people. So uh, with this hard situation, I didn't want to stay home for morning. I said, you know, I have to do something. So that I know people, a lot of people, they need uh, our help. So I asked the pharmacy just in uh, my neighborhood that I'm ready to do some volunteer work. So I started like this during last two weeks, last three weeks. And then I heard that we will have this vaccine in uh, our facility in Donald Berman Maimonides Geriatric Center. So, uh, and actually, actually, let me just uh, hold you there. I should, I should mention first of all that your um, your dear late brother was uh, a, a colonel in the Air Force, uh, and he was only sixty one years old. He wasn't even particularly old. I know that this COVID thing. There's uh, people die of so many different symptoms or causes. It seems. Did you find out exactly what happened with him? Uh, so, you know, uh, he had a little respiratory issue, So, but with puffers, he was okay. Uh, one night, just uh, his situation was not good, the oxygen was low, so they sent, uh, the family sent him to transfer him to hospital, and in hospital, when they put oxygen, he was okay. But, you know, at early morning, around 5 o'clock, uh, he had a uh, heart attack and stroke, heart attack, everything we, we, we will see as a sign of COVID. Yeah. At the beginning, we didn't know that stroke also is a sign of COVID. So the, unfortunately, just uh, almost six hours in hospital and he passed away. Uh, and how did yeah. you, how did you, I, I mean, you're here, I guess this is not a time where you can return to Iran. That's the other complication during COVID. People are not able to be with their loved ones during uh, a mourning period, right? Almost last year I lost my dad and I was able to go because it was not COVID. But this time I see that if I go a lot of uh, quarantine, a lot of, uh, and also the uh, not flight available, yes. and even in Iran, there are a lot of limitations. Yes. Even the family, they cannot gather. They should respect a lot of rules of, uh, about the uh, yes. funeral. Yes. So it was uh, very hard to hear and to see that I'm not able to participate. But I'm that kind of person that I don't want to give up, to say, okay, so it's time just to cry. No, I want, you know, I want to get up, to stand up. How do you deal with the trauma or the, um, I, I don't know, the um, 
the, the PTSD, I don't know if there's a better way of putting it, of having to see this happen. I had a, actually a friend of mine to, uh, who has had COVID post something on Facebook saying, what people don't understand, that one of the hardest parts about this is what it does to you mentally. Because while you have COVID, at any time you feel like you're getting sicker, you think, well, maybe I'm dying. Maybe this is going to be it. And of course, you've seen people have died. So as the nurse, how do you how do you keep yourself able to stay um, uh, together or positive when, uh, during a crisis like this? Uh, during this time, you know, I was trying a lot just to read the subjects, to listen the lectures about how to keep your mindset positive and to be strong first in mindset for physically. Yes, I was trying, but for me, that was a priority to help my mind to be stronger and just to uh, look for the, to see the positive part, the good part that, yes, there is a hope. One day we will be okay. And even the situation was difficult. I said, no, you know, uh, I believe in God. I said, you know, nothing. We are not here just to quickly with something easy to die is it's not the destiny of our people so yes we are losing people but it's not the end of the story so we have this situation we have this hard situation but i always i was trying to keep that hope that yes we will be better and we will uh, pass this situation. Well, so, you know, that, yeah, that hope, hope, that hope, hopefully, is being borne out with this vaccine. So now, talk to me about this past week on Monday. You, you were, as I said, one of the first people in the world to administer this vaccine. How did you get chosen to be the person, and particularly in Quebec, where COVID has hit really hard? When we received the vaccine, when I was administering said oh my god so you know now is the time that we see the victory of science so the spiritual part for me it was well uh, covered that yes yes we are doing we are treating now we are preventing that's the moment that we were waiting so long that maybe for almost 10 months we were waiting for this moment yes. now we have this moment in the hospital for the resident in our center for resident for families they are happy they are excited that's yes finally now we have a solution for hossein this. how did you get chosen to be the person who would do the first vaccine they were looking for a nurse that should be uh, fluently bilingual completely bilingual then also you mean english and farsi right no no english and french <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> <joking>. <laughs> you're trilingual at least it sounds like yes go ahead yeah then uh that the person should be comfortable in front of the cameras and uh so because the, also the moment is very historical moment yes yes so not everybody able when they told me i said yes i'm okay because with my volunteer uh, job that I was doing like la in last three, four ma uh, weeks, so for vaccination, I was okay. Usually we are, the injection for vaccination is a limited time, but with my volunteer job, I feel more comfortable. And for, uh, because I was excited for the situation, I said, I don't care about camera or anything that can happen. I know that I can do my job well, and for that uh, bilingual part also, I'm okay. Uh, so so when, when, the, when the media came and you were, I mean, I know they didn't l allow all these cameras in, but they allowed a few to shoot the scene because it was so historic, as you say. Did you get anxious? Were you, I mean, were you worried about making sure you do this right? Or were you excited about the prospect? What, what, what was it actually? Was it another day at work? What was it like for you? <laughs> so, you know, that moment, because when you have the needle, syringe in your hand, and the voile of the vi uh, vaccine on the other hand <laughs> that moment is very <laughs> particular yes. that moment because the needle is should go and you should be you know 100 percent comfortable not shaking the needle <laughs> because the voile is small and the needle is small also so you have to be very careful right. at that time i was thinking you know, now everybody's uh, looking at me 
I said, okay, you know, deep breath and just be relaxed. Just relax because just this moment for me, it was the uh, most excited uh, moment for me. Who, no. was, who was the person receiving the vaccine, the first person? One of, one of our resident. You know, it would be, in this geriatric center, we have resident. It's almost uh, 350 residents. So they knew you already? They didn't know me, but they knew that the nurse is coming. Right. Uh, that person, she's a kind of personality that uh, go talk to media. So she was comfortable for the right, camera right. and thing. Uh, yeah. And let me ask you, how, how do you feel about this vaccine in general now? I mean, uh, I, it, I, I'm not sure why. It doesn't. It seems like a no brainer to me. Maybe I'm too too trusting of our government or the medical profession, but there are people who do um, have concerns about this vaccine. It hasn't been tested enough. They're not sure. Uh, uh, as a practitioner in the field and someone administering this, what do you say to them? In this world, nothing is perfect. We don't have any other choice. We have to start. They have tested before uh, bringing to us. So we have to trust also our scientists. We have to trust uh, people who did a lot of work to find out how to make this vaccine. We, we should trust. I, I don't want to go like in a negative part. I have this part that I trust them. And, and on the other hand, we are just starting and we are not 100% sure. So we will check our resident. And as I heard from until now, our resident that they received on that day in our facility, we were able to give 237 people the vaccine. Mm -hmm. yeah, so they received. And until now, I haven't heard anything bad that, you know, the, some bad reaction. So uh, it's a hope. And it's a good sign yes. that it's working, but uh, I cannot say there. So we will waiting to see. You know, um, as a, I'm, I'm grateful for the time. I know that you're in between shifts doing your um, your important work, and so I appreciate that you've taken you've given us some time here today. And you know, زندگی خیلی عجیبه بعضی وقتا می‌دونی. Life is a strange has strange twists and turns. Here you are. I mean, a year ago. Right now, you were a nurse. You were working in Montreal. You with your family. You've immigrated to Canada. There wasn't even much talk about COVID nineteen. Certainly in this part of the world. Um, now, a year later, I mean, here you are. It, it has engulfed so much of your life. And I wonder, have you heard from people in your family or friends after the news broke that? you'd been on the front lines of this vaccine uh, in the world. And I guess your family is also still in mourning uh, with your brother. So how have they processed all this news? So uh, today is the 14th day. It's uh, that part of our uh, the mourning in Iranian culture for our uh, loved one who passed away. And uh, for me, I wish to be there, but you know, I can't. And for me, it's a sad moment that I cannot present any of these uh, ceremonies prior. But I, on the other hand, I think that if I help my people, maybe I will get uh, the feedback as from God or like Tony Kimi Kono that this Dan does, Kaizat Dar Biawanat Dahat Bows. You do something good and you get back, you, you receive it back in some other places. Life is very short. Life is very short and everything, we will lose everything. One day we will lose everything. So we, we have to be careful about our life and I think uh, to be good, to be enough effective and to be enough helpful and to enjoy life. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I appreciate you, Jean uh, Aziz, this moment that you gave it to me. And so from here also, I can ask my families if they hear my voice that try to be strong 
if they hear from Iran or my friends that uh, a lot of them, they send me the condolences. I appreciate. I thank them. Give me calm and uh, yeah. Hossein Mansur, I, I once again, I'm I'm sorry for your loss, and I'm also very thankful for the work that, uh, uh, you know, this whole time, this whole year, I've been thinking about the nurses and, and doctors and what you guys do. I, I can't imagine what you do every day. And um, so you've been on the front lines. And now, as you say, um, hopefully you're on the front lines of, of, of hope and change with this vaccine. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. And um, take care of yourself, please. Thank you very much, Mr. John. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank Hoda you. Hoda Hossein Mansouri is a registered nurse working in Ontario and Quebec. This week, he became one of the first people in the world to administer the new COVID-19 vaccine. Hossein Mansouri joined us from Montreal today. You are listening to Rook on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, uh, Instagram, <laughs> Telegram, and YouTube, uh, and uh, some other platforms I might have forgotten here. Uh, for the hub of all things Rook, rookmedia.com is where to go, rookmedia.com, our website. In fact, if you go to episodes there, we have full bios and lots of photos of all of our guests. Uh, just hit the episodes link at our website. Uh, in about half an hour or an hour from now, we've got to, It's All Persian to Us, another um, installment of the new of our new series featuring Keon and teaching us about discoveries of, of what, in fact, Iranians discovered. Uh, and in about an hour, uh, Mahsa Rahbari, the fitness instructor, the nutritionist, uh, the artist, and now popular social media presence. She'll join me from London. Uh, she has quite a story of feeling um, of coming from a, a very oppressive situation in Iran, moving to England and finding her freedom in both art and sport. We will get to that. But right now, my next guest has actually walked into the Rook studio. He is still in his 30s, but he's had quite a ride immigrating at a young age from Iran to Turkey, then Greece, then finally to Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Growing up with his three siblings and a single mother, he became a drug addict and a dealer on the streets of Winnipeg, and then transcending all of that and becoming a decorated basketball player, having won medals, honors, and awards in Canada, and then in Iran. Yes, there is certainly an interesting story here. Erfan Nasajpur is a basketball player who became a teen sensation in Winnipeg and then received a full scholarship from the University of Winnipeg, where he became the captain of the basketball team in the Canadian Inter-University League. Erfan was recognized as an all-Manitoban, all-Canadian, and played with the Canadian national team in the early 2000s before deciding to play professionally in the country of his birth, Iran. Erfan traveled to Iran to play for Zobahan Esfahan, Petroshimi Bandar Imam, Samen Mashhad, and Shahdari Tabriz of the Iranian Basketball Super League. In 2018, after a decade-long career in professional basketball, he hung up his basketball shoes in Iran and returned to Canada. Erfan is now a certified trainer, nutritionist, and mental health coach in the Toronto area, where he is dedicating his new career to helping people get into the best shape of their lives, both physically and mentally, and right now, Erfan Nasajpur joins me in the Rook studio. Hello, sir. Good to have me, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's good to have you. You agree, <laughs> you agree that it's good to have you. <laughs> yeah. yeah why Thank not? you for being here. I mean, it's quite a story, man. You Do you ever marvel at all you've been through in your life no. already? Yeah, when you look back at it, when people remind you, but I'm just living day to day, man. I, I'm, I'm sure there are people listening to us in Iran that will remember you as a professional basketball player there in recent years. Fans of basketball in Canada might remember you as the face of the Westmen, the University of Winnipeg team in the 2000s. How did you end up getting on the Westmen team? Um, well, when you're ranked the number one player in the province, uh, coaches are looking at you like a new prospect. 
someone that can help their team and uh yeah just landed over there so the university of winnipeg obviously wanted you yes the, the story goes that in your first year you get suspended from playing until the following season that's right man that's right um you know when you're in high school you get caught up with uh with the streets having fun but um well, I mean, just coach calls me to the office and uh, lets me know of my behavior. Um, my reaction immediately wasn't shocking, but the following year when you're sidelined and you can't um, express yourself on the basketball court, um, that was painful, just watching, right? But I stayed involved. I stayed with the team. I practiced and uh, I smartened up academically. It sounds like you'd gone down a pretty dark path as a teenager in Winnipeg. How close were you to really destroying your life forever? Well, I mean, there's been close calls, several close calls. I mean, guns being pulled on you, right? Being robbed, uh, drive by being pulled over by cops when you have narcotics in the car, uh, weapons. There's been some close calls, man, but uh, I believe God is on my side. You know, looking after me. Yeah, it's been scary, but at the same time, it's been uh, learning, right? It's been lessons. So, so can I ask you what, I mean, what were you doing? Were you, you were using drugs? Were you um, alcohol? What were you doing? Yeah, I mean, I partied. I wasn't, I don't think I was an addict or anything. I like to have fun, mm -hmm. right? I enjoyed myself, but uh, it was just an experience. Stages we go through, right? Kids, you grew up in a certain environment. You're going to grow up to be that way. I'm going to get to that environment and ask you about it. Mm -hmm. But I should say, by the way, I've got a lot of affection for the city of Winnipeg, not least because of my family living there. Yeah. But it's, it's an amazing place, actually. It's a very disproportionately cultural place, even though it's a small city. Yes. But it does have a raw underbelly. It can be a tough place. Yeah. Uh, and so were you in a gang? Were you, I mean, how did it express itself in terms of getting into that kind of trouble? Right, right. Um well, growing up downtown Winnipeg, the murder capital for numerous years, um, there were gangs, lots of gangs around, but I never got involved in the gangs. I mean, as I got older in high school, uh, meeting different people, selling drugs on the streets, I never really got involved with gangs per se. Been close, but it's been sports that has been my savior, right? Um, caring teachers, mentors, my older brother, because there's always the devil on one side of the shoulder, but there's also saints and angels on the other side, right? And uh, that's the side I decided to take. One year after you're suspended, you're named an All-Canadian, you're back, you've got your life on track. W was there a particular wake-up call at that time? Um, I don't think. I think it's uh, numerous things. Um, failing, school. Hey, you get this opportunity for a free education. Your mom came all this way as a single mother, and this is how you repay her, right? By hanging on the streets, getting in trouble. You know what I mean? So end up in jail or just get shot dead. What is the point? I mean, I did it because... What, 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 what was rock bottom for you? Rock bottom? Um, friends getting killed. Friends being sent to jail. Right. There's there's kind of a, a myth sometimes around, I feel, maybe it's a myth, or there's a romance around uh, s somebody going through a difficult time or a troubled kid or something like that, and sports come in, uh, a sport can be the savior. But it mm -hmm. sounds like in your case, uh, that was no myth, that, that, was it, that basketball was really kind of a savior for you. Yes, definitely. And then uh, if you're good at something, people will praise you, right? You can make it to, to play pro and, you know, when people motivate you like that, you continue doing exactly that. And uh, so I'm really grateful for the people I hung out with, the teachers, the mentors, the friends that encouraged me. Um, I don't think I came out of this on my own. I had a strong support system. My family was supportive. Uh, and even though I was on the streets because just to make a little money to help my mom, right, it wasn't always the best situation financially. So that was my motive when I was selling drugs is to help the family. It wasn't to, to party and live the, that lifestyle. It was more to help financially. 
Take me back to where it all started, if you will. Where where were you born in Iran, and and when did your family decide to leave? Right, taken aback, huh? Uh, born in '84, in the middle of that war in the '80s. Yeah. Around '87, my mom decided, hey, enough. Born born in Tehran. Or yes, born? Tehran. Yeah. That's right. But yeah, in the middle uh, middle of the '80s, uh, with that war, I was about two years old. We left, moved to Greece. Obviously, my mom just wanted a better life for her kids, right? Bombs falling on your head. What future do you have? So she made that sacrifice to leave. So we got up and left, went to Turkey, went to Greece. Do you remember what it was like living in Greece as a little Iranian kid? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I got some uh, visuals. I got some uh, ideas. It was rough, man. We were were placed, uh, you're immigrant, you're a refugee. They're not going to put you in a five-star hotel, right? So we were in this basement uh, it was almost like a zoo, right? rats and uh, cats and cockroaches. Um, I had lice and um, wouldn't shower. I mean, we didn't have food. So it was rough, man. It was rough. But playing sports, just getting out, playing soccer, just being a kid, right? You don't think about those things. But my mom did. Right? She went through all that. So in 1991, mm-hmm. you moved to Winnipeg. That's right. Now, for a kid who's born in Iran, and been hanging out in Greece. I mean, Winnipeg's a, a fine city, as I've said, <laughs> yeah. but it can be a shock in terms of the weather. It's not a huge place, mm-hmm. and and you know, even for Canadians, I mean, Winnipeg is a is it's a dry cold, as they say. But you know, mm-hmm. it can it can get pretty winter peg. Yeah, yeah, winter peg. So mm-hmm. so, what was it like landing as a kid in Canada and in Winnipeg? What were those early years like for you? It wasn't a big shock to me. It wasn't coming no, to Canada. Didn't no, feel like I mean, a big change. As a, six seven year old i mean what shock you've seen right. iran you've seen greece just another place but cold as right um just putting up with the winters is tough but uh the close facilities the way they designed it um it was fine it was fine you man. came to canada as refugees yes what was your living situation like in winnipeg for the first few years um first 15 years we were placed in a immigrant refugee community organization of Manitoba, downtown Winnipeg by Central Park. People from all over the world in this one place, from Iraq, from Vietnam. So it was uh, very multicultural, as you said. It was an experience. It was an experience. You didn't have a lot of money growing up. No, no. I don't think we had a car for the first 15 years we were living there. Um, no money on welfare. Um, mom did her best to feed four kids on her own. How did your mom, by the way, can I ask you where your dad was? Or do you, uh, you, yeah, 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 for sure. Um, because he fought in a war. Um, he was sick physically and mentally. Uh, he came with us to Greece, but because of his illness, he didn't want to be a burden to us. So he went back to Iran while we were in Greece so he, his sister could take care of him. And then we just kind of lost touch. So your years. mom was doing it by herself. Doing it by herself, man. And how did she, how did she make ends meet? I mean, how, how, with four kids, how did she What a struggle. How she did it, I don't know, man. That's the strongest person I know in my life. Your mom. Yeah. Yeah. Fetish did. I got her tattooed on my finger right here, man. Hmm. I on my neck. Um, yeah, she's my angel. Did you know how much she was doing to hold it all together when you were a, oh, a teenager? Man. Oh, not at the time. Like I said, I'm on the streets, like, doing stupid shit, right? Doing crazy things, not really taking into consideration her sacrifices. How how did you first become enamored of basketball? And, and when did you really know you had a gift for the sport? I mean, I've interviewed a uh, bunch of basketball players I think you know Chris Bosch and okay. and DeRozan and even Steve Nash over there they're 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 tall guys yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not that tall a guy no. you're like a Kyle Lowry I guess. yeah right 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 <laughs> like you yeah. I wouldn't look at you and say that cause that's a basketball player necessarily right. so when yeah. did you know I mean or when did everyone know that you were really good at this yeah um, again in high school or junior high I mean I, I would go spend my summers every single day I wouldn't miss a workout Hard work pays off, right? You got to appreciate the time that I put into it, um, the love. Uh, I remember my sister saying, do you remember you were dreaming last night saying, pass me the ball, pass me the ball? Like, 
I would pray to the stars that I play pro one day. Um, and then that reality comes after years of trying to master your craft. So, so you, by your early 20s, um, you're exceeding as an athlete in Canada. You're, um, you, do, you, you might have a shot at the NBA. And you make this decision in 2008 to go to Iran right. to play pro basketball there. Seems like, I don't want to say crazy decision, but seems like a, 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 it's definitely an interesting decision um, given how much your family had to go through to, to come out of Iran. Tell me about when you first get that offer and your reaction. The offer, oh, that was phenomenal. I mean, coming out of uh, university, you have no money, and then you get offered almost 100K to go, go play pro basketball, your passion. I mean, can't go wrong there. But, yeah, definitely some uh, some, some concerns. Even my mom was telling me, no, don't go back. She was scared. Yeah, she was scared. What was her uh, depiction of the country? War and terror and blood, right? But, I mean, I was always following the news, um, just seeing what's going on over were there. Were you scared? Um, not really, no. You weren't? You because weren't, I did, did my homework, man. I did my homework. And did you, I mean, did you, you must have had second thoughts about it, though. They're thinking, uh, am I going to give up the opportunities in North America to go to Iran to do this, despite the money and everything? Right. Uh, what, what was the tipping point where you said, yeah, I'm going to do this? Um, follow your passion or go work at McDonald's. Which one would you take? Well, d would staying mean that you were working at McDonald's? What other opportunities? I mean, sure, I graduated university, but most people graduate their university, they get their degree, what are they doing? I mean, And playing pro basketball in North America in the NBA, so it's, it's going to be a, a, a it's going to it's not as realistic necessarily as being able to play in the the, yeah, the Iranian league. Yeah, being involved with the national Canadian national team program. Uh they coach you not just basketball wise but classroom. What opportunities do you have? So them talking to you in regards to hey, you have a second passport, you have this opportunity. Then playing playing with the Canadian team against team Iran in Turkey, meeting the players, talking to the coach um, that gives you some inspiration and some security, right, before going out there. So it's all been... Um, That's interesting. Yeah. T tell me about what that was like. So this is, you're still playing with Team Canada, right. but you're playing against Iran, and mm -hmm. the Iranian guys uh, on Team Iran are like, that guy's Iranian, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of <laughs> cool. It wasn't did even... You, uh, but did you grow up speaking Farsi? Could you speak yeah, Farsi? My yeah, my mom, yeah. My mom spoke Farsi. It wasn't okay. the best. It got better when I played in Iran with, for the 10 years. So when you're playing Iran and you're on the Canadian team? Yeah, not, no, not you, the greatest. You, no. Not the greatest. But did you talk to them a little bit? Yeah, you, I yeah. talked to the coach. Uh, uh, mainly to the coach Hatami, who coached me uh, for several years in Iran, actually. So, what is it like when you, after 22 years, I think after you had left Iran, you land back in Iran to play basketball? Mm -hmm. What was it first like for you? First, it was. Uh, and if you start saying again, I didn't feel any uh, culture shock. I'm no, no, be <laughs> definitely that that culture shock changed me. Um, growing up uh, in Winnipeg, in Canada not being around other Iranians, not being around a large Persian community, you really don't know who you are. You have loss of culture. You really don't know who you are. Um, pants hanging down to, to my knees, uh, real gangster, right? But why? Because lack of culture, right? So going back home, I think it was the best decision for me. You can say NBA, Europe, whatever you want, but I think this was what I needed. This was my journey. When did you know that? Um, did you feel that as soon as you landed? or Maybe close to when I got married. Right. That's, That's a all. few years in. Yeah, right? yeah. It was like four or five so, years ago. Was still, right? So when, you, when you're first there, though, mm -hmm. were you a bit of an oddball? I mean, you're a great basketball player, but with it, were you kind of, did, it, did you have trouble integrating as a Canadian kid, uh, mm -hmm. even with an Iranian background? Not really, man. That's something uh, my brother or several other people told me. I adapt to my environment very easily, right? Like a reptile on a tree changing colors. I spoke the language a little bit, so it wasn't that difficult, but waking up to that morning prayer, right? Instead of uh, McDonald's on every corner, you have fruit stands on every corner. So that helped me take my nutrition more seriously, and that's what I'm doing now. But yeah, it's, it was uh, not so much of a culture shock, 
but uh, adapting to a new environment. What's amazing about this story is not only do you get to go back to Iran, but you basically are on a consistent tour of Iran. You get to see uh, different cities, different yes. towns, different cultures within the country. Um, what did you learn about Iran that somebody who hasn't had the experience that you've had, even an Iranian like me, um, mm. would want to know? It changed. I mean, my perspective and my view of Iran changed throughout the 10 years I was there. Early on, I mean, you don't know, right? You're watching TV, just like anywhere else. You get manipulated with TV, with media. What does that mean? You get manipulated you get brain, how? Brainwashed. So thinking brainwashed what? Brainwashed with, what uh, with media. I mean, you look at, um, I didn't know, I did not believe in God before going out there. It helped me discover what spirituality is. You but at the same time, when you force it on somebody, they shy away from it. They want to fight it, right? There's two sides to a story. It's how you interpret it. It's how you view it. Can you give me a concrete example of something that, I mean, it sounds like you you gradually, first of all, it sounds like you found, you, you do believe in God now. Yeah, a higher being. A higher you being. can call it Allah. Some people call it Jesus. I just, I believe there is a higher being. Yeah, Okay. Sure. And And give me an example of something that you fell in love with about Iran besides your wife. Uh, people's dedication to their culture and religion. All right, I had teammates who would wake up four or five a.m. in the morning and do their namaz, do their prayer. Why? Right, because they believe in a higher power. They are good people. Um, and again, it depends on how you view everything. How would you describe the game of basketball in Iran uh, in terms of the quality of the game, the organization of the sport and the league? How would it compare to what we know in in Europe or North America? Right. Great question, man. Uh, basketball is basketball wherever you play it. Uh, very competitive in Iran. Great athletes, uh, good coaches, facilities lacking, right? Uh, the floors, um, the stadiums old, right? Those are just because of sanctions, I guess, right? Um, lack of funding, right? Where's that money going for the youth? Where's the money going for sports, right? Maybe corruption, who knows? Right? Why aren't they putting money into it? So, and it feels like if the money was put into it, the talent is there in terms yeah, of the players. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You see Hadadi, uh, he played in the NBA for a few years, playing in China, amazing player. Um, Arsalan Kazemi, teammates, right? He played in the States. So uh, definitely potential. So the interesting part for me is you, um, you end up winning two league championships. You end up... Uh, retiring or ending your career as a basketball player um and then you just and you, you you even now you're talking about it it sounds like life was great in iran for you your partner that you met there was in iran um why would you decide to come back um to canada yeah right? yeah great question man great question when you drive your car and you have 300 kilometers on it 400,000 kilometers on it, it runs down. You're abusing your body. Right? You're mentally fatigued. You're away from your family. Right? And now you have a child to think about. Do you want him to be raised in this? Right? You've got to start thinking and you um, can't always use your body. You've got to start using your mind, your brain as well. And that's what I'm doing now. So from what I understand from what you just said, sometimes you speak in code. I'm not quite <laughs> sure what you're saying. So <laughs> some kind of uh, mystical yeah, code. Yeah, so yeah, so, sure. you're, so what you're saying is despite your affection for Iran, you felt like your child and, and your family could have a better life coming here. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. I mean, it's not just politics. It's not just that, but the environment, like I wanted to go out for a run in Tehran, but the pollution, right? That environment, that's your number one right right there is your, to get oxygen and breathe. If I started choking you right now, right? Two, three minutes, you're passed out. If you can't breathe, you're done, right? Do I wanna live in a city that's polluted? No, 
I want my fresh air. I want oxygen. Tell me about meeting your wife. Where was that? Basketball court. She was a fan or what? No, she was playing. She was, was playing. A, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah, were the yeah. fan. If we were playing the other day. Uh, she's great. She played as well. Uh, saw her on a basketball court. Saw her at a party and then just asked her name. Just fell in love. Wow. Yeah. So wh- what do you mean you saw her on a basketball court? You were walking yeah, by and... No, I was playing too. So one okay. of my, one of my uh, teammates invited me to go play at this private... Uh, area on Tehran, Sharikar, I believe. And yeah, she was playing guys, girls, they're all playing together. So yeah, that's where we met. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And how did she feel about the prospect of moving to Canada? She enjoyed her life in uh, in Tehran, but uh, greater opportunities. Her sister is living here. So that was a little motivation for her to come, but uh, you got to make sacrifices in life and you got to change. Erfan, there's something you said earlier that um, when you were talking about your mom and your family and you said she's never gone back to Iran uh, mm-hmm. to visit. So it occurs to me that while all those years that you were playing pro basketball in Iran, um, she, she never got to see you play there. Uh, your family never got to see you play there. Um, that, that's kind of um, heartbreaking in a way. Yeah, yeah, I mean... It is. That was the toughest part for me is not having family there, right? And early on, it was difficult, but again, sacrifice, right? Having the ability to to make good money and now I can go home and buy my mom a nice house, buy a Range Rover, buy my mom a nice beautiful house in a beautiful area of Winnipeg. That's that satisfaction. That's that sacrifice. Sure, you make some, I mean... You struggle a little bit being alone, but again, there's a, there's a reason for it. How did moving back to Canada feel? Just this, recently? Yeah, this time two, was it? Two years ago? Yeah. Um, again, new, it's change, going from Winnipeg to Toronto. Yeah. Um, it's not that difficult. I mean, again, adapting to your environment. It takes a little bit of time. Be patient, but just... See what you want to do and just make sure you're like a reptile on a tree. Yeah. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how have you replaced the adrenaline, adrenaline rush that you would get being a basketball player? Mm-hmm. I mean, was it hard to retire? Um, no, I just made a decision. I just made a decision. Uh, that's that. I enjoyed the journey, made the money. Nothing seems that hard for you. Uh, uh, am I seeing the real air fawn here? <laughs> Are you really this you cool about though? everything? You well, you're so just kind of like, my, oh, my wife says the same thing. You don't stress about nothing. Well, maybe it's because you've been through some yeah, tough times in your life. Right. So these things are not big that's for you. Right. But I'm, that's what I'm asking. Are you yeah. really this way? You're like, oh, yeah, you, I mean, it seems like back. you could roll with anything right now. That's right. I'm laid back, man. If you can run a 10 mile marathon and tomorrow you're forced to run one mile, shit's easy. It's a preparation. Would you change anything in your past? Would you want anything to have happened differently, even all those difficult years, even living in poverty, even being here as a refugee, even being uh, running into that trouble in, in, in Winnipeg as a kid, as a teenager, as in your early 20s, even being suspended? Right. Was it all kind of, uh, I don't want to say worth it or a blessing, but um, would you wish any of, any of that to be different now? No. These are all just lessons. Whatever mistakes I made, they were just lessons, right? Whatever happened to me, those are just lessons to be stronger, physically, mentally. So tell me about being a, a life and health and mental health uh, coach now. Um, experiencing both parents with illness, physically and mentally. So I know the power of mental health and how it can fuck somebody up so that mental side I was always curious that's what I got my degree in psychology right studying sports psychology so that's that's an important aspect because if you're effed up mentally the body will shut down organs will shut down right that's stress if you don't address it depression and and vice versa too and vice versa sure if you abuse your body yeah if you abuse your body definitely but 80% of the reason people go to doctors, it's rooted through mental stress, 
right? So taking care of the mind is definitely something important, especially now with this COVID and all the fear being instilled in our brains, being brainwashed. In my perspective, um, that will f f you up. Yeah, that will f you up. You you talked earlier about you mentioned um, the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other other shoulder. Um, you've got your life together in all kinds of ways and you've made a lot of people proud of you. Is the devil still there on that shoulder? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, that's the mind. That's the ego trying to confuse you, lying to you. You can't do it. You suck. Just quit, right? But that's self-doubt. That's the only thing that's holding people back. I don't believe the other excuses. I don't have time to work out. I don't have the money. No, nah. It's all self-doubt. So overcoming that self-sabotage, that devil on your shoulder, right, by doing numerous things. And what is your, I was going to say, what's your yeah. prescription to keep the, the <laughs> devil at bay? Um, gratitude. I wake up every day and I just thank God for the elements of life, mm. breathing and just focusing on my breath, for having clean water, for the sun that shines on us and helps the trees grow. Right? Just simple things like that reduces stress, reduces anxiety, brings you down to earth. Instead of saying, fuck, why don't I have three houses and two cars? Why don't you just appreciate that air that you have, that oxygen that you have? Right? A final question. Um, about your mom. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful looking into your eyes when I asked you about your mom earlier. Yeah, you saw that, huh? <laughs> Fereshte, huh? Yeah. That's her name? Mm -hmm. And you've got her tattooed on your on your body. Um, this is somebody who sacrificed her uh, a lot uh, to take these four kids and bring them to Winnipeg, living as a refugee, uh, and then putting up with all your nonsense in the, Big time. In, the in those teenage years. Um, what are the conversations you, you have with her now? Mm -hmm. I, I can only imagine she's proud of you now. And and it sounds like, was that a true story? You bought her a house and the, the Range Rover and all that? Yeah, all well, the Range Rover, she doesn't drive. Okay. Yeah, but uh, the conversation now? Yeah, how, how, um, how's your relationship? Since, yeah, since university, it's a great relationship, man. Um, she calls me Doctor, Mr. Everything, because <laughs> um, I'm always moving. But uh, the relationship is great, man. I hug her, I kiss her, I tell her I love her. Because, um, yeah, she's my angel, man. And what would she say if I asked her about you right now? What, what, how does she feel? Um, like I say, I, she's got to be proud. <clears throat> what, what, does, what does she say to you about the years you put her through? Um, man, I can't even imagine what I put her through. But four kids. But I think she was more more engaged with the voices in her head. You know what I mean? Sure, she had to think about four kids in downtown Winnipeg, right, with gangs around and violence and drugs and alcohol. But I think uh, she was more occupied with that voice. And that voice, I mean, she had to take medication for that. And taking that medication long-term, side effects. Mm inflammation right pain joint pain so that's why i've taken this route holistic coach mm. right to heal the body naturally without medication prevent it before it happens because i lost a father my mom's health mentally and physically suffered because of not taking care of your mind and your body well, all right, doctor. <laughs> Very glad that how things have worked out for you. It's fascinating, you. your journey playing basketball in Canada for us in Canada and for us in Iran. And um, I only wish you the best. Let's give a shout out to your, uh, mm -hmm. your, your coaching. Is it a gym or, a, or a, what can we give a shout out to? Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for having me. Thank you. In the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Mixed it up there. Yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> I think right you now. said something like, it's an honor for me to be yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, well it is Everybody. actually. Bow down. Yeah. No, that's not what I meant by that. Um, right now, just outdoor training. I have uh, outdoor training for athletes. Um, but my main focus right now, and I'm using affirmations and I'm trying to be more dominant online. 
Right. So where can people find you online? Uh, online, I'm on Instagram. Coach Erf, right? Uh, Coach Co- Erfan, I believe. Coach yeah. Erfan, okay. Or Trainer Erfan. Um, it's Facebook great. It's great that man. you don't yeah. know your Instagram yeah, handle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to help you promote right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yeah, it's uh, you know, it's well, one Irfan of those. Massage for you. you can just find me on Facebook. We'll uh, put it. We'll put a yeah, link on yeah, our yeah. site. Find me on Facebook. What a pleasure! Thank you, my brother. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Erfan Nasajpur, a professional basketball player, now a certified trainer, nutritionist, and mental health coach in the Toronto area. He's been with me here in the Rook studio today. Hey, Erfan has uh, left the studio. Uh, what, we've re- we've replaced one athlete with another. Keon is back <laughs> in the studio. Quite the one contrary. great basketball player, and one him. not so great basketball player. <laughs> uh, the mics are back on. Groovy Shia, Captain Reza. My God, that story. I Erfan, I can honestly say, was the biggest surprise to me on Rook. I came into this not knowing. Is this another one where you say I didn't think I would like him, and then the no, guest not <laughs> sends all. me no. a text message afterwards? <laughs> and it's like, what's no. up with that girl? She didn't like me. I'm a very loving person. Okay. <laughs> no, I. I I didn't know anything about Airfon, so I came into this cold turkey without any prior knowledge. And I found myself getting emotional uh, listening to his story. I truly, I, this man is, has come through his life extraordinarily and made it out on top and the what i what made me extra emotional is is the ending that he did all of that and in the end he bought a house for his mom for his that mom, yeah. made my heart melt yeah so i i love this man yeah. i really do and i hope everybody listens to this interview i really do well if they're still with us <laughs> yeah, let's then they them. hopefully have yeah <laughs> Uh, Captain Reza? Yeah, what a what a way to turn your life around using, I mean, th- there's not a lot of people that use uh, different mediums like sports or even art, uh, film, different, different uh, avenues to turn their life around, right? And this guy, like, he came on top at the end of it. And you can, t- he, he's not a, he's not necessarily uh, a very, uh, outspoken type of person. Mm. He's not very loud. Like He's very quiet and I don't think he's reserved. done a lot of big, big interviews. No, I don't uh, think he's he, done a lot I of mean, big interviews. And he was in Iran. He was playing in Iran for 12 years. So Art? he wouldn't have done a lot of you know English interviews and stuff. You've done a lot of interviews with various athletes. Mm. Do you find that in different... Because th- there's a lot of athletes that you see, like huge athletes on TV that do press conferences and stuff. They're pretty well-spoken, but even them, like they're rather quiet. I found that Erfan was kind of like that too. He was very... They're, the athletes are generally not good interviews. Mm. I mean, until they reach their later years and they're Billie Jean King or their, you know, somebody, uh, uh, Andre Agassi, re- reflecting on their life, um, partly because they are taught to be very disciplined. They do a lot of scrums right mm. after games or whatever, and they just have to sort of say the team line of like, well, we'll give it 100%, thank yeah. you, you know, whatever. Yeah. And so they, they don't tend to be the best um, feature interviews. I found him um, fascinating. I also just want to say that, you know, the, it's clear that the Iranian diaspora, when we talk about people of Iranian descent outside of Iran, it's a really, really diverse group Mm -hmm. and we tend to sometimes think about the you know what you might call the usual suspects you know the kind of people that uh cultural figures or you know there's Maz Jabrani and you know the people that we know or the people who turn up at cultural events or you know the people who are the big business uh, leaders or something um here's a a really important member of our diaspora who has a different voice you know even the way of speaking is different he's a street guy he's you know he's an athlete he's a guy who grew up in tough streets in Winnipeg and you know then he went to Iran and lived in all these cities playing basketball I mean it's a really really interesting story He's really, he's real. real. He's totally real. real. Mm. He's real. Uh, Groovy Shai, you want to say something? Uh, I miss my mom. Ah, (laughs) Shai. Now I'm going to (laughs) cry. Yeah, that's it. Do you want to do another impression of your mom? Just I thought I was thinking that you feel yeah. better <laughs> now that I, don't, I bet you his mom doesn't <laughs> give him shit about not eating KFC and. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, well, it is Thursday, and before we get to our next guest in a little bit, Maso Rahbati in London, looking forward to talking to her. Before we get there, it's time for our regular Thursday segment. She is a woman of letters, rook letters, that is, a dear friend, a diaspora blend, a gym fanatic, and a non-redhead who can be erratic, but lovable and funny and on a journey to discover what we actually discovered. Here we go, Bachaha. It's all Persian to us with Kion Nademi. Who knew Shia was such a good dancer? <laughs> oh my God. No one. No one knows. <laughs> what have you got for us today? Chav, uh, let me start by saying there's never any shortage of negative publicity when it comes to Iranians, as you know, yeah. whether it be in the media with people in the streets of Iran screaming, death to America, or Hollywood movies portraying us as terrorists. So I'm on this quest to find positive aspects of being Iranian. Mm -hmm. So you know how Iranians like to claim that everything was first invented by the Persians. Yes. This is a common theme in our culture. It's not always true, but once in a while, there is some truth to this claim when it comes to certain things. Yes. Now, this invention that I bring up today might just be the greatest contribution ever known to mankind. Oh, there's, wow. there's your first clue. What about female kind? <laughs> well, human that kind. too. Okay, I know, yeah, I, yeah. I should say yeah. kind. Human kind, sure. Uh, yeah. Human kind. Well, cool. here's the next clue. Uh -huh. With the holidays coming up next week, there's going to be copious amounts of this beverage being consumed in homes worldwide. Eggnog, no. <laughs> no, not quite. Shut up, wine. Yeah, there you go. Oh, there yeah. you go. Yes, Whoa. wine. What? what? We <laughs> discovered wine. Well, let me let me oh. let me continue. Was it a discovery or this is discovery or a, it's an invention? Well, that. Oh, that, we invented wine. Sorry. Can I just get to my Please story? do the second. <laughs> All right. Wine, a.k.a. Therapy, therapy for me. Now, this is highly contentious, but wine may just have Persian roots. You're welcome, world. And this is extremely ironic because, of course, it's been banned in Iran since the 1979 revolution. But I digress. Let us dive right into this and explore, shall we? The earliest evidence of actual wine was discovered in Haji Firuz Teep. And this is an archaeological site in the northwestern part of the Zagros Mountains, which is modern in, in modern day Iran. Wait, say that again. The what? The, the, the first, say it again. So the first evidence of actual wine was discovered in the Haji Firuz Teep. And this is an archaeological site Haji in the north. Haji Firuz, like Haji Firuz? So, yes. The same guy? Yes. yes. Oh. I'm not sure why they called this. There's no connection to Haji Firuz, okay. but they just, they, they named it this. Okay. okay. Let All it right. go. Oh. <laughs> so uh, several mysterious jars were discovered at this site, dating back to more than 7,000 years ago. Mm. It was later discovered that these jars provided the first scientific proof of wine production in the world. Wow. Did you know this? No. And just a little later on in history, in 2500 BC to be exact, the beautiful city of Shiraz, oh. Reza's hey. hometown, Shout out to Reza. Yeah. <laughs> established a <laughs> reputation for producing some of the finest wines in the world, and thus became Persia's wine capital, there you go. which is of course where the name of the popular Shiraz wine comes from. Mm. Shout out to Hafez, the Persian poet who actually, uh, who extensively mentions Shiraz wine in his poems. Mm. Now, you know wine wouldn't really be Persian without some good old Persian folklore attached to it, now would it? No. Okay. Legend has it, the history of wine began when a beautiful princess lost favor with the mythological King Jamshid. Oh. Overwhelmed with pain and sorrow, the princess tried to poison herself by drinking juice from a jar filled with spoiled grapes. After experiencing the juice's <sighs> intoxicating effects, she fell asleep. Mm. The next morning, the princess awoke to her surprise. With and a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Oh, <right. laughs> and discovered she that no... That jam sheet. What did <laughs> <you> <laughs> it, was, it was good. Yeah, yeah. She discovered she no longer felt <laughs> depressed, but rather rejuvenated instead. She took her discovery oh. to King Jamshid, who became so enamored with this new potion that he accepted her back, and thus she regained the king's favor. Thereafter, King Jamshid... That's some wine. <laughs> it sure yeah, is. Yeah. <laughs> and it goes on. Thereafter, King Jamshid shared this wonderful finding with his entire court and decreed that all of the grapes grown in Persopolis would be devoted to winemaking. Wow. And so after all, wine has Persian roots. It's all Persian to us. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> 
Did you guys know this? Um, no. I mean, no. I, I know Shiraz wine. Yeah. But I thought, but that doesn't mean we invented it. Yeah. I thought, you uh, know, no idea. We well, this is it. highly contentious because there's been findings of winemaking in other parts of the world much later. But it's. Um, it's hard to say whether Persia was the one that kind of educated the rest of the world on how to make wine. It could be that different parts of the world separately discovered it, but it's one of the earliest. I wish findings. I knew this a couple of years ago because my ex was Italian and she convinced me that oh. the wine was invented by the Romans. Oh. And I Dare bought it. She? I was like, but oh, has, she, has she been to Haji Firu's teep? No. <laughs> 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 no, no, I don't think yeah. so. I have no idea what that is. Does she yeah. know about Shiraz wine? Uh, no, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Shiraz wine, There's, you know what's weird is there was a um, an Australian friend of mine, I see everyone, I had said, oh, Shiraz, that's from Sh that's from you know Iran. Shiraz, and, and then an Australian friend of mine said, no, there's a region in Australia called Shiraz or something. So the name remember. comes from Shiraz, but then later they adapted the same type of technique grapes or grapes or to, uh, you know, they planted it in their own areas in Australia. Australia, so we, we we're compiling a list here. So far, we've got mail, yes. like the postal, postal system, system yeah. postal yes. system, and wine. Yes, wow. wine. Uh -huh. I mean, these are all the things that you need in life. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you know, when I first told also my iPhones, did we do iPhones? Uh, <laughs> anyway. I, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. <laughs> iPhones <laughs> were back in uh, Rom yeah. in the uh, 13th century. Yeah. But you know, yeah. none of my non-Iranian friends believe this because they see Iran as this Islamic regime. They're like, oh, of course, wine wasn't created there. But so when I tell them, when I prove this, they're shocked. Well, wine is pre-Islam. It is. As it turns out. It is. Right. Talk to Hafez about it. He knows. You know? <laughs> have a chat with Hafez. Uh, Groovy Shia, you, you've stayed uh, mum on this. I would, I would expect that um, there would be dang show albums written about uh, the discovery of wine. Actually, yes. I want to ask Reza something. Okay. In is it related to this? To the wine, oh, okay, yeah. yeah or just Every like, time that I went to Shiraz, so we went to Galat, you know Galat. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, an area nor yes. northern Shiraz. Like. So, and always when I ask for Shiraz wine, uh -huh. uh, they brought me a. Um, it it wasn't red liquid. It was kind of pink liquid, but it tastes great and it did it taste sweet like a rosé it, no it's like a red oh. wine it tastes like red wine but the color is pink so do you know about no that? i don't know because I, I didn't drink when i was back home mm. i lived when i was like 17. For, first of all how did you get alcohol shia i thought it's <laughs> illegal in iran yeah uh, under the table yeah. oh at the yeah. at shia, shia had everything yeah. <laughs> he was <laughs> living a, like a, a king big, uh, had just go downstairs <laughs> knock on the door three times you got the wine yes. and the, yeah yeah the, actually that's the kind of basically life. the way it yeah. works right yeah exactly. when we're doing this we've been working on this pink floyd special there were all kinds of by the 1990s there were jam sessions there were concerts mm. that were happening underground uh -huh. in Iran where people were doing Pink Floyd yes. covers um, even though obviously music was I mean not only was music banned even uh, um, I guess well selling Pink Floyd or whatever would be banned there would be, yeah, there's no access to any of it so that's um, so cool yeah. I find that so cool yeah there was an underground culture yes yeah um, thank you Kian Nadami for this latest installment of It's All Persian to Us Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, thank you very much. Well, she is a well-regarded artist who grew up in Tabriz, but then found artistic liberation in studying in the UK. But then her artistic works became seen as political, and she knew a return to Iran could become complicated. At the same time, she's an athlete and fitness instructor and found herself in London involved in two passions that she could not easily pursue, as a, especially as a woman in Iran, art and sport. The question that bedeviled her was how to choose between these two loves. Well, given that she is clearly an industrious and inventive person, she created a third solution, which is 
pursuing them both. Mahsa Rahbadi is an Iranian personal trainer, nutritionist, and artist. Masa has grown a large social media following and has appeared on BBC and Manoto discussing her art and fitness work, as well as being published in national newspapers and press around the world. She is the energetic presence behind the popular Instagram channel, The Painter PT, that is painter and personal trainer. And her unique style and energy has garnered her an audience first in the West, as she did much of her work in English, but more recently, as she's posted more instructional videos and commentary in Farsi, she has a large fan base in the Iranian diaspora and in Iran. Masa says her goal is to be a voice for female empowerment around the world, but particularly back in Iran, and she's on a campaign to create change. But first, right now, Masa Rahbari joins me from London, England today. Hello. Hello, Jian. Nice to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. You know, you posted something on Instagram this week uh, that's you holding a poster that says, the fact that I only live once is my biggest motivation. Uh, it's kind of self-explanatory, but tell me more about that. Sure. Um, people always ask me, what motivates you? And uh, my answer is always, well, I only have one opportunity to make the most of my life now because tomorrow might I might not be here. So this is my motivation to make that change that, I always want today, not tomorrow. Live in the present. Because tomorrow might be late. Yeah, that's it. Well, I'm hoping to excavate that a little bit. But uh, in the meantime, I should also say, you're not just someone who's committed to living in the present, maybe part and parcel of that. You're an incredibly energetic and positive person in your social media posts and instruction. I mean, the the energy is quite infectious. Is that really you? Uh, and, and if so, where does all this positivity come from? Why aren't you a brooding artist since you're <laughs> since you're a painter? Why aren't you scowling <laughs> at people and you know taking people hostage with your art? Oh uh, well, um, being me, really, um, I get the, to answer this question all the time. That why are you so happy? How can you keep being so happy all the time and uh, it goes back to when I was I think 17 and uh, life was very tough for me it, and it it was so oppressive the situation that I was living in I grew I had a very tough um, upbringing I would say and living in Iran as well so everything was extremely uh, oppressive and uh, I grew up in that situation or in that uh, in that society where I only had my mind that I could control over things because a lot of things was out of my control so I decided when I was 17 that I can't let this life and rules control me so I'm just gonna start being happy I decided to be a happy person when I was 17 I guess it's quite young to decide just yeah. to be happy forever yeah. but I, I started learning how I can be happy from within and not uh, sort of be dependent on what happens around me I mean, it's it's an amazing uh, thing to pursue. I want to. I'm going to ask you about your upbringing sure. in, in Iran, but but on this note of being happy. So, I mean, no one would blame you if you can't be happy all the time. Once that becomes part of your brand, do you have days where you feel like I you don't feel like being positive, but you have to summon it to to do a post on Instagram or or an instruction? <laughs> Absolutely, I'm a human being. Don't forget this, <laughs> like everyone else. Um, but what maybe makes me a bit different from everyone else is that I try harder to keep myself happy. As soon as I feel down, I find solution. I find a way that I'm just like, I remind myself, hey, listen, you can't just let yourself be down like this. Get up, do something, just don't wait there. This is what I do all the time to myself. I don't let myself to be down for too long. But I, it happens to me every single day. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, I, I get, get it. Down. But how, always, how, how do you? Uh, but I mean, we've always heard that the thing to do is get up and do it. And but it's the getting up part sure. that's, uh, that's yeah. Hard. How, so uh, what's your um, self talk? What's your remedy for uh, that? Absolutely. For me, it's reminding myself of why I'm here. What? What? Why did I even start? Why did I even start doing what I'm doing? And just reminding myself of my mission my goal and that really keeps me 
excited forever. Sometimes at night I cannot sleep because I'm so excited for the plans that I'm doing or planning. I just can't sleep. I just want to get up and do something in the morning. And this is what keeps me going. When I'm down, when I'm just, the fear takes over, when I'm feeling uh, anxiety comes, I'm just like, no, 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 wait a second. Think about your plans, your goal, your mission. And that it, ki- it kicks it kicks in quite badly and then I'm just like off and running again <laughs> and what is the mission can you give it to us in a brief uh, um, what, yeah, a, a, sure. a line or two what's the mission my mission has always been to empower people especially women uh, that's something it's always been in me so much I wanted to just uh, I don't know how to say it, but I wanted to empower people through what I do through what I love through just my passions, I would say, art, fitness, nutrition, whatever, just to help them to achieve their potential. Uh, this has always been my mission. Yeah, I would say uh, that. I mentioned that you made this decision to fuse your worlds that would seemingly be intractable. I'm, I'm sure there were people around you. I don't know this, but I'm guessing that there were people around you in recent years saying you have to pick. You have to either pick your athletic side, your fitness side, or you have to pick your your artistic side. You're not going to be successful if you try and do both. You did try to. Sure. You have put them together. You fused this your art and fitness worlds in, into one. It's quite unique. How did you? Um, how did you have the audacity to think you could do that? Sure. Uh, if I'm being very honest, all my life I heard that I cannot succeed in what I want to do. It could be it's art or fitness or nutrition. All I heard it was that you can't do it, you can't succeed. They're not like important subjects because, as you know, Iranians usually study I don't know <laughs> law or Doctor medicine. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Doctor Mohandes and all of that things. But uh, I refuse to do that. And uh, so I've heard that all my life. And then once I decided that, no, I'm just going to do what I love to do. Um, and then it got to the point I was like, I, I don't want to choose to do one. I want to do it all together. And people kept telling me that you can't succeed. You have to focus on what I did that it made me successful. Is I didn't listen. I kept trying and failing. I failed so many times that I can't even say how many times, so many times. And I kept failing, trying, failing, trying until one day that I met the right mentor. I love, by the way, having mentors and like getting help because I think that's really important. When you're struggling, you need to ask for help. And who is this person, this Yoda? um, The the mentor that changed my life is one of the most well-known fitness business coaches around the world is uh, Jamie Alderton. Um, He's the one that changed my life with one thing. He went through my content my instagram and uh, he found out a lot about me and my story and then he told me i'm just surprised why you don't talk about your story it's so unique and you need to bring that up in your in your passion in your work and why don't you bring your art into it and i said can i do it really everybody else told me not to do it and he said no that's what you actually need to do and i was like wow I always wanted to do it, but I've been always like kind of put off because people Mm -hmm. told me I will not be able to succeed. So I did it. And as soon as I did it, everything started just blooming and growing so much. Everybody loved it. People were so interested. Then I made art for all these fitness influencers and fitness professionals. And then I became the painter PT. (laughs) It is really inspiring because uh, um, we are told, I mean, I I think of myself as someone who has a variety of interests who's struggled at times in my life with, well, you know, do I want to pursue my political science side or be a musician or... um, um, be a broadcaster and I've done all of those different things you know at different times and for sure there is somebody who would say well you you've launched this fit mind and body academy um, as is Adam to get put the art aside and really focus on building this <laughs> business what are you doing uh, and uh, interestingly enough if there was ever a time 
when you could be a, a renaissance person, a person who can succeed bringing all of you know the, the, your superpowers together. It, it's probably right now, it's probably the 21st century because yes. you have the means to fuse those things, broadcast them out there in whatever platform and find people who have those interests. So you call yourself a multi-passion entrepreneur and it is working for you, right? Indeed, absolutely. Okay. Well, let's get to the story that your mentor said okay. you should use as your inspiration. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm going to get to your channel and your growing fan base, but take us back. Tell me about growing up in Iran. You're, you're from Tabriz. You say you grew yes. up in an extremely restrictive environment. How so? What, 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 what was yeah. so restrictive? Um, so I grew up in a very male-dominant uh, environment and family society so yes i was born in tabriz and raised in tabriz and then moved to mashad so mashad is very relig religious as you might know yes, yes. so I, like tabriz is very traditional people are extremely traditional and uh, maybe not as religious as mashad but then moving there it just it was worse one worse than another one <laughs> and then going back to tabriz again when i was a teenager so it, Yes, grew up in a society which was extremely male dominant. And uh, as a woman, as a young girl, I really had no right to say, not to say nothing about anything. And uh, especially that I was interested in art and uh, fitness. Uh, I used to be a basketball player, really wanted to pursue it as a as a like a profession but unfortunately i wasn't able to because i wasn't allowed to play basketball after a certain age and um sorry why weren't sorry. you allowed to play basketball it's because playing basketball meant i needed to be outdoors and that i wasn't allowed to as a young girl because you mean because, your parents didn't allow you yes uh -huh. yes so i wasn't allowed to wow. and then everything else to do with art and uh, like basketball music whatever that it it required you to be outside it was not really allowed so with art it was more of a, like being in control of the family uh, because i could do it in my own little like room and you know or the classes that i was going it wasn't like too many f males involved it was mainly women so it was kind of allowed and uh, so yeah i grew up um it, experiencing this uh, oppression and being really restricted but i was a i was a little rebel you were so. a rebel yeah I, i'm getting <laughs> that idea did, did, didn't stop me didn't so stop I, me. I don't mean to i mean if this is too heavy family stuff for you don't have to go there but as somebody who grew up in the west it's quite extraordinary to me uh, this is uh, sort of it's sort of next level patriarchy to say you can't leave the house what's the philosophy behind that is that just are, were your parents very religious or what why couldn't you as a teenager leave the house go outside it's because i think um it wasn't religious it was more traditional family being worried about you as a young girl that the guys out there is kind of like protecting you but right. without knowing that it's not really protection it's it's damaging more than anything and uh, it just it just made me to learn how to deal with the very difficult restricted situation I think that's why I'm a very good problem solver. So I always right. find And uh, so art and it. sport represented yeah. freedom to you somehow. Indeed, freedom and it empowered me. These two. I feel really empowered and I feel And yet like and yet you I'm couldn't free. you couldn't do the I mean did it so is there a point where you're in your teens where you go I I'm going to inevitably have to leave Iran to be able to feel this emancipation to be able to pursue these things that are the things that feed my freedom or or was that not something that your mind had, uh, would go to at that point I I dreamt of like leaving uh, in having freedom I didn't know what I could expect from life but I dreamt that I I I wished for it I wish that one day I will be able to live my life freely without any restrictions. And I think I was lucky enough that it did happen to me, but I did not expect it to happen. You were arrested a few times as a teenager? Yes, I was. What were you doing? 
I was just walking in the street like everyone else does and uh, I guess being a happy person laughing out loud and uh, looking very happy it's just it wasn't very I wasn't miserable and that's why I was arrested for three times but I was just so lucky that I managed Sorry, really to they away. arrested you for being happy yeah they just stopped me because they asked me why I was laughing out loud and why did I like look like what I was looking like back uh, then which was nothing really like weird or strange. was that in Tabriz uh, this was actually in Tehran, Tehran huh? <laughs> funny enough yeah wow and, uh, and yeah. I guess that didn't go over so well with the parents when you would get arrested no like I was lucky because before they know I managed to escape and <laughs> I just just managed to escape right. before they take me to prison actually <laughs> Uh, I made up a story and I managed to convince them in somehow. But the second time I, I, I was arrested while I was with my mom and it was a horrible uh, memory because they were horrible to my mom and uh, I didn't know why they arrested me that time either. And they never, so, yeah, they didn't uh, explain this? No, 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 they would not. They just said they didn't like the way I look and I didn't even have a makeup. I didn't have anything that could just like it looks very strange and i we were just like on vacation in tehran from tabriz and i really had no clue about these people that arrest people i was just walking in the street i was only 19 years old and uh, they just didn't like the way i look and when my mom asked them why did you arrest my my daughter my my uh my daughter they said they just pushed my mom and they was they were really rude to her and my mom was really scared so I asked her to calm down and then again I managed to get away somehow they made me to go and buy a different clothes uh, my mom actually went to buy something different to bring it I, I wore it and then they allowed me to go uh, with just my mom begging them so yeah this was literally in the middle of Tehran wow yeah, <laughs> these stories these stories never get old for me because I I didn't grow up there and and I you know yeah, I, I I have family there obviously I have friends there and you, you know I I you can sometimes just sort of think well their life is I mean I know know it's a bit different but it's basically the same as you know what yeah. the way we're living here so tell me what's going on inside you at this point are you could you I mean, could you imagine when you were in Tabriz in your late teens even in your early twenties that you would be who you are right now this public person based in london with a growing fan base around the world who does these <laughs> I, I mean is that something that you really uh, in your gut knew that 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 could happen for you <laughs> so i think i always had this picture of me that one day i will be influencing people hmm. i i had this picture and i wanted to be that person yeah and uh, I, I, I just told myself when I was very young, I said to myself, well, one day I'm just going to be talking to thousands of people from all over the world and I will be, they will be influenced by me. I always told myself, I remember I, I, had, a, this, I had this little book that I wrote things that I wanted to achieve and that was one of them. But I never thought it could be here. I had no idea, but I just knew I will do something. I will make a big change and i always wanted to make that little positive change wherever i was so you come to the uk for the first time in 2009 and you've said you've actually said you were lost when you first moved west because there were no rules and regulations you know that, that all of a sudden you're kind of wondering who you can be now that you have this freedom can you talk about that interesting juxtaposition yeah, it was an interesting experience. Um, I felt completely lost. I would say in the last few years, I'm only feeling that, okay, maybe I feel that I'm not lost anymore. <laughs> but it took me so long, took me 10 years maybe to just feel that I'm okay. So yeah, I think not ha not like having many rules that you need to actually say, okay, I need to do this because that rule tells you to do this. I was like, why is this? It, it felt weird to be free. Mm. It felt so strange. Yeah. 
I didn't know what to do with myself. I mean, the metaphor for that, we don't want to go too far in the direction because some people would take umbrage at comparing Iran to this, but but the metaphor for that is prison, right? When somebody's been in jail for a long time, they're, yeah. they're, they're, when, they, when they're yeah, released, yeah. they don't know what to do because you know they don't have a regular schedule. They don't have somebody telling exactly. them where they're supposed to be. It was they confusing. Don't. Yeah. It was so confusing. <laughs> so the the story is, I mean, this is the part I don't understand. You 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 when you first come in two thousand and nine, you you don't think you're necessarily staying in the West, but then Absolutely. something happens with your art where it's seen as political, and uh, and you realize that this is going to be an issue for you returning to Iran. Can you tell us what happens with that? So I think uh, it's more uh, maybe more political than uh, it's more of a being against the religion, I think maybe that was seen as that because as I uh, spoke about it, uh, we were doing these life drawings where we weren't allowed to do so and we were uh, doing it underground basically in, in, in like hidden places that this nobody is in, knew. In Iran. We had, we, yeah, in Iran, we uh. had like naked model. Uh, I used to go to these places and draw for 13 hours some days and it was crazy you know we had this like we had music on there were guys and girls we all mixed up together some places they were actually they found out about them and they were closed down and people were arrested but this happened after I was here Okay. I was probably lucky enough. And then I, I don't know, back in 2009, there were a group of people that were arrested and the, on the website that they were, uh, they had, there were some artworks that were published and part, some of the art, those artworks were mine. I had no clue about it. I, I don't, I still am just shocked about what happened. But uh, I just found out through my, through a friend of mine who was an artist as well. She lives in Canada now, <laughs> just a bit, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, then I was just shocked and surprised. So, meaning that, that if you had happened. been in Iran at that time, you would have been arrested? Yes. I actually, see. It would have been, it would have been a risk. And uh, if I was there and that happened, 100%, I would have been arrested. Was it? painful for you when you realized you could not return to Iran? Absolutely. I, I, it was the mo- one of the most difficult decisions that I had to make not to go back to Iran. Because the way I left, it was that, oh, see in three months. I'll see you. Like, I was middle of university. I was like, you know, I didn't even say goodbye properly to my friends. And I was really enjoying my life. Back then, when I left Iran. We were living in Tehran. We actually just moved to Tehran, and in Tehran, uh, and I was studying in Surrey University. Um, so, and that's where I, I actually was enjoying. The, it, it was the most enjoyable part of my life, being at university. Just when you're Surrey getting university. used to being just, in Iran, you know, right? Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, it was like I was having the best time of my life. And by the way, e- and even s- though you've described yourself as a rebel, you you've said that you were never particularly political growing up. In other words, you weren't you weren't an activist. It wasn't like they were they no. caught up to you being some kind of an activist or something. It's that your paintings were seen as being somehow uh, heretical, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you realize you can't return to Iran. What were, what were your first years like in in the UK? Oh, those years were the most painful. You have no identity. You have nothing, basically. And that, to me, was the most painful part because you don't know who you are. When you actually... Um, claim asylum you just don't know who you are anymore you you're lost you're in a in in a country that you don't speak the language i did not speak a word of english really your english is very good thank you i appreciate that you and you claim you claimed asylum is that what you you yes yes i did and i didn't speak english i didn't know what like i didn't understand anyone didn't know how to speak it was the most like I would say difficult time of my life and then um, but again I just knew I have to make it that's it there was no other way the the funny (laughs) thing about a situation like that is I guess it does really teach you who you are Uh, it's like a crash course in figuring out who you are and what did you learn about yourself when you were suddenly thrown into this 
position that you hadn't expected to be in. In a foreign country, don't speak the language, can't return to Iran without getting arrested, uh, seeking asylum. What did you learn about Massa? I learned Massa is very strong, I would say. She survives. Uh, and um, in any situation, I, I, that's what I would say. And I just realized no matter what happens to me, I find a way to make it out of that situation or make to, or turn that situation into what I want. That's what I learned. Good on you, Massa. Good on you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let me ask you about this. So what you've done with that, this, uh, the, the painter personal trainer. Um, sure. First of all, again, the collision of worlds, the art and sport and fitness and nutrition. Do you feel, uh, this may be an obvious question, I'm sure you've been asked it before, but do you feel <laughs> physical activity feeds your art or that art somehow feeds sport and fitness? Is there a relationship for you? I think they all feed each other. They all feed each other. That's it. I can't say what feeds what. Okay. It, it, it's just linked and it goes around. It's like a little circle. What about how you actually navigate your life? Do you uh, portion parts of your day where you say, now I'm the fitness instructor <laughs> and now I'm the nutritionist <laughs> and now I'm going to paint? I mean, how, how, how do no. you actually do it? <laughs> that would be funny, isn't it? <laughs> well, I don't, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I actually am one of those people that I do not do very well with the schedule. I'm very much of a, a spontaneous type of person in everything. I, I jump into things. That doesn't bode well for the academy. I think the academy needs a... I think, I think it doesn't, the, but still works very well. The Fit Mind well. and Body Academy ways. needs a schedule, doesn't it? Of course, of right, course. Right. In, some, in some parts, you need to schedule. I think you're of more course. of an overachiever than you're letting on. You're, you're making it sound like you don't, uh, you don't have a plan when you do. <laughs> And I do plan, don't get me wrong, but uh, maybe more spontaneously. I plan spontaneously. Does that even make sense? <laughs> uh, it does. It does. Uh, yeah, with some positivity thrown in because you're, yeah, exactly. you're a massa raf. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a, for, uh, like more, a popular Iranian soup, Osh. <laughs> Uh, well, well, speaking of Osh, I mean, you are also a nutritionist, and I know yes, now indeed. a lot of your people you're speaking to are Persians. And I, I always ask this question when I when somebody is is a nutritionist, if not a fitness instructor, uh, can we eat and love uh, our Persian cuisine and still be healthy? Is it? Of course, is, you uh, can. Okay, all right. <laughs> It's something where you're not going to tell me I can't eat rice and bread, right? Listen, listen if you probably know me by now, if you look, to, look into uh, my Instagram, I'm actually anti any anti diet. I don't do diet stuff. I don't tell people not to eat. I tell people eat everything. <laughs> That's why my academy is called Tanasova and Doma Bedin Regime. <laughs> It's great. In Farsi. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm signed on for the not dieting part. What else do I have to do? Could I just not? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's exercise, right? You're, that's the idea. To stay to um, be fit or eat in I, moderation or what, what's, the, what's uh, the prescription? I would say, I, I don't even say moderation. I say eat variety. Ah. That's it. You get a lot of feedback and love on social media. Who's your audience? A lot of people are from Iran and living in Iran. Men and female, doesn't matter. Uh, I have audience that they're like 13, 12 years old, 15, 16, starts from that age and goes all the way up. So people are just very kind to me and I really appreciate my audience. But tell me, it's interesting because you started doing this, um, your channel in English and then you pivoted to Farsi. Most of it's in Farsi now. Uh, tell me about that decision and what it meant for your, your audience. Sure. Um, when, before the lockdown starts, before all this COVID thing happened, I was just doing everything in English and, uh, you know, and then when COVID happened and we went into lockdown, I was like, how can I serve my community? That's the first thing that came to me because I was like, not everyone is a fit fitness coach or fitness instructor. How are they going to motivate themselves to exercise? Because that's going to keep them sane. And then I just realized, well, 
a lot of people that live outside of Iran, they have access to a lot of things. But people that live in Iran, they do not have an access to a lot of things. So I'm just going to start doing these five days live uh, <clears throat> live workouts and uh, in Farsi. That's how we started back in uh, March. Uh, I started these live workouts uh, during the week and people slowly started following me and then it just grew and grew and then academy i founded the academy and now it's a big big community of uh, iranian people that um helping are you surprised at how quickly it grew growing quickly yes indeed uh but as at the same time as well i knew i'm i'm genuinely helping people so more people will come to me and the bigger it gets I happier I get because I know I've helped more people. So that's my mission complete right there. Is there some uh, disconnect where uh, if you are speaking to, um, say, a, a, a teenage girl in Iran, that's part of your audience, uh, and they see you as a role model, um, yeah. that it must be difficult in the sense that you can, you can, counsel them or you can give examples of what they should do and certainly fitness regimes etc but ultimately they are stuck in the country that you've left because you felt it was too repressive so in some way or another they can't actually be you is there how do you address that disconnect yeah that is a very good question um i think i I do see myself, I put myself in their shoes as well. I experienced that myself and remind myself of who I was when I was living in Iran. So uh, what I do really to to encourage them, I would say, because they could dream big and they could be themselves, but in, in, in a place that they dream of. And uh, so I, I usually encourage them and, uh, and inspire them and what they I hear from them is that uh, I inspire them so much. They want to be like me one day. They want to do this. They want to do that. So I think I, for me, it's educating them. When I first started doing these things, I was getting quite a lot of also negative feedback from people that live in Iran, the religious people or whatever, and uh, labeling me for in any all sort of ways uh, regarding the way I look or how I present myself and. Uh, it did i did expect it in the beginning but then at the same time i tried not to get annoyed by this because i knew there will be only a very small percentage of people that are going to think this way and if I, even they do i'm not going to respond in a way that i'm angry or i'm pissed off so what i did i brought up these like messages or feedbacks because again my aim is to educate young girls it really is, especially everyone, especially young girls. I I brought up these uh, these comments and feedbacks, and I talked about it. I just said, I understand where this comes from. At the same time, I'm not angry. I'm not pissed off. Uh, I think everybody has their own opinion, and it would be great to respect each other. So I kept doing this, and now I get zero messages like that. Hmm. <laughs> It's just interesting to see how much it grows and it, it does work if you just persist and insist and <laughs> make it happen. Uh, you said, you said, I've been judged all my life, but I'm carrying all on. All my life, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, even now, it, 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 that keeps happening. It's not, it's nothing new. I'm, I'm just so used to being judged, uh, which is painful, I, I must say, and uh, it really, impacts me lots of time but i try to kind of get over it you know uh, just even now being on social media just doing what i love wearing what i love because i i would like to think that uh i'm a grown-up woman and yep. i have the right to choose what i like to wear do say <laughs> all of this but of course i still get uh, very much judged and attacked sometimes i would say from very close people to me and that is painful i think that's the most painful part of. oh i you. see not you're not the trolls on the internet it's you're talking about people who are uh, as well who are I guess yeah. family or friends or people who yeah very close people to me that sometimes that is the most hurtful part that when you just see your close circle uh, sometimes judge you and they don't see 
the positive and they just look at you in a very judgmental way. What, what would they judge you about, Rasa? So mainly it's about the way I, I represent myself, I uh, what I wear, for example, maybe showing body parts uh, as a fitness uh, trainer, as a fitness coach or, you know, I don't, I have nothing to worry about showing my body, absolutely not, because uh, to me, people seeing my body, it just represents, I'm just as normal as everyone else. I'm nowhere special. For example, the other day, I was uh, showing that I have belly like everyone else does. And uh, you don't have to certainly have a six packs all the time, all, all around here. And then people were so surprised that, wow, you, you ha you're so brave that you actually show that you're not perfect. And that that made so many people feel comfortable and to be actually nice to themselves and i've received so many messages since then saying that thank you so much for showing your body to us and showing us that you're just as normal as we are and I, I, that to me uh, is uh, it was a big thing tell me about your initiative for international women's day 2021 oh yeah um Okay, that's a very big event and that's one of the things that does keep me awake at night. I can't sleep when I think about it. <laughs> um, I decided since uh, I always want to empower women and uh, do something for my community, for my country, I would say, people. Um, I'm going to run this 24 hours uh, challenge where I will be exercising and painting non-stop for 24 hours mm. uh, and I'll be painting 24 portraits of 24 inspirational uh, inspiring not sorry inspiring Iranian women um, oh, wow. and to me that's like my mission is complete because it's art and fitness it's two passion that I have and I always had and I'm bringing it into something bigger to, uh, I will be raising money for Amnesty International Women's Rights. And uh, hopefully that will inspire more people and hopefully that the money is going to be raised and um, hopefully that will help a lot of women around the world, uh, especially Iranian women. What an amazing initiative. That, that sounds, um, uh, it sounds remarkable and it also sounds like it's right up your alley. You've, <laughs> you've done Absolutely. it again, you've brought together your worlds. Uh, it's such a pleasure to get to talk to you and, and to, to hear your perspectives. Let me let me uh, uh, give you one more final question because uh, sure. and, and it's you know this show. I mean, Rook has become this variety program, and we explore all kinds of ideas and issues and people. But at its heart, it uh, it's been a show that um, we we say you know stories to from and about the Iranian diaspora, and really trying to um, grapple with issues of identity amongst those of us yeah. of Iranian descent or Middle Eastern descent around the world, trying to figure out who who we are, uh, because yeah. there really hasn't, because we're not, you know, we're, we know that we're not the same as somebody who's been in the UK for generations and generations and generations, but we're also, uh, you know, I've often said, if you threw me on the streets of Bashad, I'd probably, you know, I, I might not fit in. I wouldn't know where, what to do. And so, <laughs> so who am I? So who are you what what is your relationship with iran and being iranian these days especially because so much of your story is about the cause of so much difficulty for you was iran being in iran moving west has been your emancipation what does it mean for you to be iranian for me to be iranian is it's it's a I don't know how to say it, but I would say I don't know if I mind even being Iranian or not. I it's not something I insist on it. Maybe I would say I I am who I am because I grew up in Iran. I was born and raised in Iran. Then I say I am who I am because I found my new home in England, and um, I would say. Being an Iranian for me is having perseverance and that's it. That we, I came out 
of a country that was extremely oppressed and uh, that made me to be who I am today. That's quite an answer. Indeed. Thank you for this today. It's been uh, it's been great uh, um, having feeling a taste of your positive energy. <laughs> uh, oh, thank and, you so much. And your uh, productivity and your perseverance, as you've just said. And um, I uh, really appreciate what you do. I, good luck with the the Women's Day Initiative, and I hope that uh, uh, we'll we'll get to see you before too long. Post COVID, back in my hometown of London, I would I'd love to see you. Absolutely, Jean. I would like to just end this with my favorite quote from Maya Angelou that I really resonate with, and that is, my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive, and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. Beautifully said. There's always room for Maya Angelou. Thank you for Absolutely. this. Absolutely. No problem at all. Thank you so much for having me. Khodafis. Khodafis, khodafis. Masa Rahbari, an Iranian personal trainer, nutritionist, artist based in the UK. She is the woman behind the Fit Mind and Body Academy and the Painter PT, the Painter PT channel on social media and Instagram. Masa Rahbari joined us from London, England today. And this is full time for Rook today. Remember our website, the hub of all things Rook, where you can check out all our previous episodes, become a patron or subscribe at the very least, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Each episode, producer Susan, Ponta the artist, thoughtful Negin, the fabulous Keon, Savvy Roham, Araya Merdad, Master Muhammad, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you, you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Our big four-part series, Why Pink Floyd, coming on Monday. In the meantime, Mizunbashi. Mizunbashi.